Happy New Year! Don't you love that time of the year when everyone gets a bit crazy, has a few drinks and allows ugly people to have a hug and a kiss as well? We think it's fantastic. Anyhow, it's almost time to get back to work. How relaxing. That's right, no more partying, just the nice, comfortable, wonderful confines of your office and your modem. <laughs> Who wants to party when you can uh, work with the world's best software? Never mind. Later on, we can look at, um, uh, at freedom and how uh, open source is helping big business to go just that way in the future. Later on, Mark Shuttleworth, his very self, pops in to demonstrate something absolutely amazing. And once again, we have so many prizes, I can't begin to tell you, so I won't. Open source software exists as a result of the combined efforts of millions of computer programmers, users and software vendors from around the world. They share their intellectual property freely and they believe that software should cost nothing and should enrich the lives of users. Open source software is the alternative and biggest challenger to closed source or proprietary software. It generally costs the user nothing. It can be distributed freely to anyone. Download it, use it, modify it, and give it away. It's a whole new world. Open source is the future of computing. Now imagine if all the computers in the world got together and imagine they worked together and imagine all the hard drives booting up the same, and then John in and a bit of a crash. That would be the supercomputer to beat all supercomputers. It would even be cleverer than the rainbow nation of the United Nations of silicon hard drive chips, or cleverer than me. The weather report you see every night comes from calculations done using data from thousands of devices. Barometers, weather balloons, thermometers. In the old days, all of this data was plotted manually to allow meteorologists to spot trends. But systems were slow, and because of the volume of information, not all details could be taken into account. Weather prediction relied on making educated guesses and was prone to errors. Then the Cray supercomputer entered the scene. Because of its immense power and speed, it allowed scientists to analyze more data much more quickly. The Cray made weather predictions much more accurate. Today, with every home PC processor approaching supercomputer power, it's possible to link several ordinary computers together in parallel to obtain more processing power than a Cray supercomputer at a fraction of the price. This is a field called distributed or grid computing, and it's being used in everything from weather prediction to genetics to medical research. Professor Lex Holt of the Witts University School of Computer Science is a specialist in large-scale system configuration. The thing that revolutionized it, I guess, is A, the, the internet, and B, the fact that now even your own humble computer used for word processing is powerful enough to do um, some serious computational work. Now, if distributed computing uses a whole network of dedicated computers all linked together, the internet opens up new opportunities for linking those computers. When you're using your computer for normal tasks like word processing or web browsing, it's barely shifting out of first gear. There's a whole lot of processing power going to waste. Why not let a group of scientists use your machine to help search for extraterrestrial life with a project called SETI at Home? They made their, the program that, that you have to run on your computer uh, easy to run, easy to install, and you can run it as a screensaver. So you can kind of feel that it's not really taking any power away from your computer. From extraterrestrial life to the human body, now that the human genome has been mapped, this blueprint for how the human body works is being used to develop cures for illnesses. But doing the mathematics requires literally billions of calculations. Dr. Fouri Hubert is the head of the Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Unit at the University of Pretoria. What we do here is we use computer techniques to model and analyze biological systems. The amount of data that comes out of a typical genome project can be enormous. Uh, a small bacteria may have something like 2 million characters in its genome that we need to analyze and figure out what they're doing exactly, how they fit together, what they mean. And that's a very small example. Big things like humans and plants may have multiple millions of characters in their genomes. And we often use the same kind of applications to analyze all this data, but it has to be applied to multiple data sets at the same time. This is where parallel computing is of extreme use to biologists, so that we can perform things in hours or days that would have taken months or years to do otherwise. The whole field of bioinformatics is extensively based on open source, and if it wasn't for that, it would crumble within days. Philosophically speaking, why would open source be better in distributed computing? It's better from a security point of view, to have code that everyone can look at. The second thing uh, is, 
accessibility. There are large parts of the world, many communities, that uh, simply can't afford the um, software investment required to run most closed source programs. Um, and the third thing is modifiability. The great thing about open source is you can make your own changes. But it's not just super scientists benefiting from distributed computing. In the very near future, when common household objects have computers on board, distributed computing will be used to allow devices to communicate intelligently with each other. Imagine this gadget talking to... This gadget. Talking to this gadget. Talking to this gadget. Talking to this gadget. Talking to all of this. Great idea. No wasting spare processor cycles that are lying around doing nothing. Lazy computer, get back to work. Every week we meet the big guns, and no guns come bigger than Bruce Perrins. He's a project leader at Debian. He was the author of the open source definition, and also the founder of the open source initiative. I can't believe how many things he's done. His business card must make some small circus horses blush. Uh, let's start simply. What is the definition of open source? Well, open source is not just source code. That's the most important point. It is both a program with source code that you can modify and a set of rights that come along with that program. And without the rights, the source code is useless. These include the right to use, modify, redistribute the software, and it is only those rights that give us the partnership that makes open source possible. When you talk about the FOSS movement, the free open source uh, software movement, what distinguishes free from open? Well, Richard Stallman feels that you should talk about freedom first and then get to practical matters, like this is great software to run your business. The open source movement is sort of the opposite, but we get to the same place. We say, let's give business people great software that helps them do their work, helps them save money to spend on things that are important to them, gives them the freedom to run their business the way they like. And then, as they get deeper into this software, they will understand that there are freedoms that are important that make this possible, and they will come to accept what Richard Stallman has to say. Proprietary software. Is it just well marketed? Because in many ways people say open source is more cost effective, it's better for your business, it can be customizable and better support. Why do people still go for proprietary software? I submit that open source works better because it doesn't have the huge overheads of the retail paradigm. It does not have the risk of the contract paradigm. When you do something under contract or even with your own employee, but only for yourself, you have the burden of all of the cost and all of the risk of that development. So why not go open source with your non-differentiating software? And then you share the risk and the cost with other people, even your worst competitor can be your partner on that software because it's non-differentiating. Thanks once again and uh, have a great day. All right. Right, here's a couple of things we should chat about. First of all, um, DVDs. So many people have asked us for those on um, uh, the episodes. Well, three people, my mum, her single friend uh, Flo, and um, her brother-in-law who's in prison currently, but I don't want to talk about that. Um, it will be available from our website, www.goopensource.org, um, at the end of the series. It's all 13. Uh, it will be in, available in about seven weeks' time. So that's quite exciting. And coming up next, uh, Tiger Brands goes open source, and Mark Shuttleworth gives us an intro into a little-known but really rather useful drawing program. Ooh. I'd like you to go to your pantry right now. Well, no, don't go right now. Hang around for the end of the program. And at the end of the program, when there's something dumb on, like a soap opera with a, a man in a speedo and a sort of a hairy back called Leaf or Ridge or Canary Island, I don't know, uh, go then. In your pantry, you'll probably find that more than one food item is made by a company called Tiger Brands, one of our biggest uh, food suppliers in the country. And, uh, and they're about to go open source. How do you think they could possibly count all those cans, boxes, other things, things wrapped in paper, uh, some not in paper, and others never in wood, for example. Well, of course, they use computers. 
Think of what you buy every month when you do your grocery shopping. Tiger Brands touches our lives and our stomachs in more ways than one, with products ranging from breakfast cereals to main meals, from sweets to pharmaceuticals. It's a company with IT requirements that can only be described as large. Tiger Brands is on our live network, um, almost 3,500 users, um, encompassing 136 sites around the country, about 150 odd servers, excluding our application servers. Um, yeah, large. <laughs> For a company like this, data is immensely valuable. The entire inventory has to be controlled, from the manufacturer to the supply and delivery. We run quite a large Oracle environment, um, Oracle applications. Um, that is pretty much the food manufacturing system. It handles the raw materials, production, right the way up to delivery and dispatch to the customer or to the stores, running all centrally as well. Although they had used open source in several non-critical situations, the Oracle application had always run on proprietary Unix, but when they were faced with a software upgrade, they decided to investigate migrating to open source Linux. How did the cost and efficiency and security affect you choosing open source versus proprietary? For Tiger Brands, the cost is obviously an issue like every other company. Um, the task was given to the IT department to come up with a solution which met all those requirements. Um, security being a strong aspect, uptime and availability of the system to the users, very huge factor. The, the task wasn't really to come up with an open source solution, that just happened. Everybody was really saying to us, including the provider of the application being Oracle, that um, there's no reason not to look at open source solutions. In a company that handles financial transactions, security is naturally a major consideration. The question is often asked, how secure is open source? The biggest argument's always been that um, with the code openly available, any hacker, cracker can, can see what's going on. But the argument to that is, and so be it, but the, the, the fixes come out as fast as the hackers and crackers find them. Um, if so, quicker. You, in open source you have tens of thousands of developers working on the application worldwide all the time. With proprietary, pretty much it's small populations of developers which are, are overworked and overloaded. Uh, it's, it's, it's given us a host of options, which we never had before. There you go. So when we say open source means business, we mean business. Uh, and now it's time to meet some people whose business it is to get business involved in open source. This week, our Geek of the Week is from a company called Obsidian. He co-founded it. His name is Anton de Vett. Anton, thanks for joining us. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Tell me, you, you co-founded Obsidian. Yeah, that's almost 10 years ago now. Um, we were studying engineering at RAU University. And I saw this really interesting thing called Linux, played with it for a while, and then said, but I'm sure there must be a way to make some money out of this. So we started a business, and well, it's 10 years on. So just tell us a bit about um, and what Obsidian does. Um, we use Linux in all sorts of ways. We uh, develop on it, we train Linux, we uh, sell Linux CDs, and nowadays you get um, supported Linux products, which we sell as well. But what we mainly focus on is trying to get open source into the business world so that they can uh, benefit from open source in various ways. You yourselves weren't really kind of business-minded people oh, no, at not first. At, not at all. We were a bunch of engineers, a bunch of geeks that knew very little about business and what uh, we had to learn the hard way by doing it, seeing what works, and finding out how do you sell a free software into a market that doesn't understand the concept whatsoever? I mean, isn't it strange that people kind of find they react to something that's kind of more cost effective with doubt rather than yes. kind of diving into it? You get two types of people. The one, if you say you're charging money for this, they say, how can you? It's free. And the other uh, a bunch of people that say, um, but uh, your competition is 10 times uh, as expensive. Uh, how can this be good? So it's a very fine line to walk and you have to explain to people the concepts behind it before you can, if you can even start selling it. The bigger companies that you're doing projects for, you say they're embracing um, open source. Well, one of the first big companies that we started doing open source work for was Nando's. And they originally said, well, what you're telling us sounds wonderful, but go prove yourself. We've, uh, our system in South Africa is running, we don't have one in Australia, so go uh, make it work there and show us. So I spent a month or two, three there uh, uh, setting up a system that did all the communication systems for them and they liked what they saw there so I redid the whole t uh, system here in South Africa. And that's been running for about five, six years now. Anton, thanks very much for coming in. 
been my pleasure. Anton De Vett from Obsidian. Uh, we're going to take a small tea break. Well, you take a tea break. We'll stay. We'll clear the table so you can come back with your tea having done nothing. We've done all the work and you can sit on the couch and enjoy the program while everyone here works really hard. I hope you feel terribly guilty and you better enjoy this break. Right, off you go. Go. As his girlfriend once said, you can kiss my astronaut. Mark Shuttleworth is standing by with a look at an open source alternative to vector art programs. Today we'll be doing it with Inkscape. Inkscape is a vector drawing package, so you use it to create line art on a PC. It's like Corel Draw or Adobe Illustrator or Aldus Freehand. Unlike programs like Photoshop and the GIMP, which create bitmap artwork, vector programs create artwork that can be resized without creating artifacts. Those jaggy edges that you get when you expand a bitmap too much. Although it's only on version 0.4, it is already remarkably mature. It saves documents in the web-friendly SVG format, with features like transparency, gradients, node editing, pattern fills, ping export, and more. The Active SourceForge community contributes plugins, and there's a feature wishlist on their site, and upgrades and patches are being released monthly. So if you think you're the next great design genius, then Inkscape is the free software tool you would use to develop your talent. It runs on both Windows and Linux. See you again same time next week. For any information on the software that Mark's just featured, please go to our website, which you do by pointing your browser or at, uh, at the website, uh, as you know, it's probably on the screen around about now-ish. So that's fantastic. Uh, we give you free software on free CDs, and um, that's free, and there's no charge, and it's also gratis. So that's also quite a useful thing to have if you have nothing and you want something. That's how it works. Our website's really hot, but even hotter are the numbers, 441. But it's a little trick there, because they're not really three numbers, that add up to nine, four, four, one. They only add up to five, because the middle four is actually the word for F-O-R, so it's like four, four, one. So there's four and one, and that will all be explained in just a moment. Wouldn't it be hot if you could buy one computer that four people could use simultaneously, running whatever software they need to run? The 441 is exactly that. Moshe Mafisa of the HPI Community Center in Lumpopo explains. The 441 is a computer that has one CPU, one hard drive, with four monitors connected to it, four keyboards and four mice. Instead of buying four machines, you buy just one machine, and it does the job for four people. This is one product that was developed from, from South Africa, looking at um, the environment within, within South Africa as a whole, as a developing country, to find solutions that are tailor-made for our own environment. Right now, this homegrown phenomenon is being used to create a call center industry in this poverty-stricken town, according to Marcel Couturier. My company came in and we built the call center. Everything that you see around here was built from us, um, from the technology right to the carpets to everything and at the same time doing the facilitation of the call centre support learnership. So the idea is, um, at the end of the day, to have the learners, once they qualify, to employ them in this call centre. We've got the technology, we've got the infrastructure, we've got everything here. And now they've realised that because of our timelines, we can compete with the rest of the world. The 441 is based on an open source Linux system. It uses open source. So now it brings down the cost tremendously, not only from the hardware perspective, but also from the software perspective, where now you don't have to buy uh, licensing. You just load the free open source software on it, and voila, there you go. The 441 is also being piloted at the University of the North, where they have found it stretches their computing budget much further. And now, get your sticky feet out, because we're going web crawling with Refilwe. And if you can, please call the police or an ambulance. I think I'm actually stuck on TV, on TV. If one of your New Year's resolutions is to make a bigger contribution to the world, then point your browser at www.distributed.net. Download the free and open source distributor.net client software and within minutes your computer will be helping solve some of the toughest cryptographic challenges in the world today. This software monitors how much brain power your machine has to spare and essentially donates it across the internet to various tasks that need supercomputer power to run. So, now that you've tasted online collaboration, you might want to head for www.tweaky.org. It's the most flexible, 
powerful and widespread web-based collaboration platform in existence today. The idea behind Twiki is to make it possible for virtual teams to work together seamlessly as if they were all in the same room. Lastly, with all of the acronyms and weird words to be found in the open source world, you might feel the need for www.foldoc.org. It's an online dictionary of computing terms. With a very simple interface and short, concise entries, you can ease your confusion and even learn terms that computer geeks themselves will need to look up. Now before I power down, it's time to recap today's sites. www.distributed.net is the place to go if you want to add your computer to one of the biggest grid computing networks ever www.tweaky.org is your free and open source online collaboration launch pad and www.foldoc.org is your free online dictionary of computing. Right, if you missed any of those or previous episodes, get to goopensource.org uh, where you'll find all the links to sites we visited on the program ever uh, throughout the entire program. But first, Get ready to win! We've got a photo smart camera and a printer bundle from HP, plus a 17 inch flat screen monitor from LG, two DVD writers, plus two 1000 Rand clothing vouchers from Soviet once again, and those prizes will be flown to our lucky winners by dawn wing couriers. Just answer the simple question, is Inkscape A, an open source vector art program, B, a beautiful landscape done in ink and pen, and C, is it when someone breaks into prison? Just SMS your answer plus your name to 34357. The SMSs are charged at two rand each. And the winners of last week's competition are... Gary Walker from Johannesburg wins a 17-inch LCD monitor from LG. Freddie Fenter and Barry Locker win a DVD writer from LG each. Robert Green and Tanya LaRue win Soviet jeans vouchers worth a thousand rand each. And Silke Gehring from Johannesburg wins an HP digital camera and printer. Well done. Did you know that you can now be accredited with your international computer driving license? Oh yes, all very exciting, all very open source. Go to ICDL, International Computer Driving License, uh, .org .zar, and you too can become a qualified driver on the cyber highway. So next week, we'll be looking at VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, all very exciting and uh, involving interesting people whose software we can fiddle with, which is very exciting. But now, coming up next, uh, a wonderful, wonderful reality program about downtown Johannesburg. You hear some gunfire, and after one bullet, you have to guess what gun fired it. It's called Squirt for Squirt. Jahan, welcome, yay, Fandan. Stay alive and good night. Thank you.